beautiful prayer, as Brother Yu usually says, right? Thank you for your wonderful prayers. Uh, we are into the book of Joel today. Joel, um, chapter 1, verse 5 to 15 is the text we'll be reading from. The book of Joel, chapter 1, verse 5 to 15. Let's read responsively this morning. This is the book of Joel, chapter 1, verse 5. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. It has laid waste my wine, um, sorry, vine, and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers. For the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. Put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Let's read together. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty, it comes. Amen. This is the word of God. Um, last Sunday, uh, probably later, uh, later part of last Sunday afternoon, uh, I, don't know, I was out and, you know, throwing away garbage. And then I realized the air quality was so poor. Uh, I could smell like burning smell, you know, a scent of, of, of cinder. And first we thought it was, uh, you know, somebody else, somebody next door neighbor burning their, uh, you know, having their fire lit up in the fireplace. But it was a familiar smell from last year. And uh, it was the scent of campfire, right? Uh, nobody was having, having campfire. But it was uh, the smell of, of um, a forest fire uh, far away and the smoke had, had traveled all the way to where, my, where I lived. And uh, I, I was wondering, is this going to be a yearly thing? I thought it was just a, uh, you know, um, in a very rare occasion, but it seems like we're smelling, smelling smoke and burning, seeing burning forests every year. And uh, we know that, you know, it's probably global warming and is it going to be a yearly routine and it concerns and saddens our heart to see uh, not just the forest burn, but people uh, being, uh, you know, hurt by this, and there's a lot of damage, and uh, people's lives are even um, are extinguished because of these um, catastrophes. And not only is the environment, you know, in trouble, uh, uh, you know, we see, we know the, not only that the forest is in trouble, but also in the ocean, you know, the, the, they say the temperature is rising, and there is to be a lot of seaweed, like forest, but it's gone here in the north, northern uh, California waters, and abalones are gone, and sea urchins are gone, and it's being devastated even inside, under the water. And to hear all these things, it seems like the earth is aching all over, it's sick, and uh, what can we do about this? It makes us sad. In fact, the world is broken. Not only is the world, the environment, the, the nature is broken, but if we look at our relationships uh, among family members, it's also broken. Personal, the, uh, uh, in, our, in our hearts, individual hearts, it's only scratched up, also hurt and broken as well. The words um, divorce, remarriage, 
counseling, um, and uh, you know, insomnia, and uh, you know, uh, depression. This word vocabulary is a normal day, you know, everyday word that we use. It's not a specialized condition. We experience this everywhere around us. We find many broken relationships, uh, broken families, broken individuals. And if we're honest, we cannot live any day, any single day, without crying, without being in tears. In fact, our hearts are welled up with sadness, with uh, stress, with this um, devastation that we see around us and inside of us as well. And uh, if we look at attack, try to you know, find a solution for ourselves, we can't. Who has a solution for global warming? Can you name one person that has really found a breakthrough in, in this problem? We hear about all these uh, suicide occurrences in the U.S. They're, they say there are about you know, tens of thousands of people committing suicide every year. And uh, is there any organization or any individual that has come up with a, a viable plan to reduce the rate of suicide in our society today? The life that God intended for us was a life of blessing. He blessed us. He blessed the man and the woman to, to uh, conquer and to, to till the ground and to make good use of it and uh, bless the earth through our presence. But it seems like nature has cursed us and it is attacking us. And there are incurable diseases. There are incurable phenomena, natural phenomena that we can do nothing about. Again, when we're focused on ourselves to find the solution, we, we have to admit, with all our advanced tech and science and medicine, we cannot. We cannot fix the things, the, the hurt and the, 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 uh, the, the, the difficulties in our lives. But let's approach from a different, uh, different angle. If, if it is God who's allowing these uh, devastation and suffering to happen in our lives, what does he see? How does he see the difficulties and the pain in our lives? And as we go into the book of Joel to find that answer, maybe he can also provide us with a solution, his solution, on how we could cope with the, the daily frustration and mourning that is welled up inside of all of us, secretly in all of us, in fact. God gives a very uh, interesting command to us in the book of Joel in the face of these sorrowful, tearful moments. He says, we should mourn. He said, just mourn. Cry, mourn, wail, in fact. Through this passage we read this morning, I want to answer the question, why should we mourn? For what shall we mourn? I don't have anything on the uh, sermon outline in the bulletin for you this morning, but I want you to write, if you can. I have two points this morning that gives an answer to that question why we should mourn. The first is this. We should mourn to have a tender heart. God's intention was that we should mourn to have a tender, soft heart. God speaks to Joel, the prophet, and says that God will, will um, judge them. He will punish the nation of Judah. And uh, what were some of the problems that the nation of Judah, southern kingdom, was to experience? It wasn't global warming or suicide problems that we you know, experienced. It wasn't family issues. It was a different kind of issue. There were different issues, but nonetheless, it was real uh, prob problematic and difficult issues. We go to back, back to verse 5 and talks about wine. Oh, you drinkers of wine, you must awake and you must weep and wail, it says, because the sweet wine you are tasting right now, it will be cut off. There will be no more wine. There will be no more delicacy in your life. And uh, if you read a little bit before this verse 5, verse 4, he also talked about locusts, you know, it's a very gloomy way. What the cutting locusts left, the swarming locusts has eaten. What the swarming locusts left, hopping locusts has eaten. So the crop is gone, the vine, the wine will be gone. And uh, what is he talking about? He's talking about an attack, uh, a foreign attack. In verse uh, 
In verse 6, For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth. That's a lion, it has the fangs of lioness. So the growers have worked their entire year, sweated, and they've invested so much, but somebody else is going to steal, want to take away their, their produce. And uh, you should wail, you should cry, you should be mourning because of this coming reality, right? In verse 8, he talks about a different, he shows a different picture. A lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. Imagine a uh, newlywed uh, young woman, you know, she, after like a month, lost her husband to a sudden, you know, disease or sudden accident and she, he's gone. You know, it says, he, the Bible is saying, you should lament like this, uh, this new bride. You know, uh, I remember many years back, um, I and my wife, uh, we attended this uh, couple's conference. It was a Christian conference. And uh, over the weekend, we would do special things to, you know, activities, uh, seminars, in order to talk to each other and to understand each other better. There was one activity that uh, was very touching, uh, very moving. Uh, they had us write a letter to the other person, assuming that that person passed away. And if uh, you were at that, or maybe, maybe before they were passing away, and you were at their deathbed, and if you were to write something, your last, you know, um, uh, wish for them or want to some, say something to them, you could write that on the paper. And so I did. I started writing and I, I kid you not, I had never cried like that before in my life. Just even the thought of losing my spouse and all the things that I, I wanted to say. Of course, the point is, you know, do it when they're alive. <laughs> do whatever you can to, you know, express your love and, and so forth. But I was uh, crying like a baby and, and bawling. I cannot remember call another time that I cried so much. And, and God is saying, wail like that. As if a, a young woman has lost her husband. You must grieve. This is the command of God. Not only of this family relationship, but also uh, even with the priests, they should also wail. In uh, verses, uh, verse 9, uh, it says, the grain offering and the drink offerings are cut off in the house of the Lord. The priest mourn the minister of the Lord. So the ministers who preside over the worship and they do religious activities, you should mourn too because the people will not have enough to give to God as an offering. Imagine if you came to church, but you don't have, you, can, you're, you can't afford to give any offering to our God. It will be a devastating situation. He also talks about farmers in verse 10 to 12. The fields are destroyed. The ground moans. The grain is destroyed. 11. Be ashamed, tillers of the, way, of the soil. He's talking to the, the uh, farmers. The vine dries up. The fig trees uh, languishes. And pomegranate, palm, and apple. All these things are gone. It's, it's all dried up. There's no produce left. Uh, you know, back when I was in Korea, I had a friend. His, uh, his family owned a lot of land. And so they were farmers, and he actually helped out during the summer to help with the rice paddy, right? Uh, they had about eight acres of land. Uh, that's pretty big, right? Maybe not so big for farmers here in California, but for Korea, it's eight acres is pretty big in Korean terms. Ilman pyong, you know, and with rice fields, paddies. And I heard from him that no matter how much drought there is, you know, how much, you know, the weather is bad and that maybe a, uh, you know, a hurricane comes and even destroys your crop. If you're a farmer, you, if you, and you have eight acres of land, uh, no matter how severe the drought is, no matter how bad the situation is, you and your family have something to eat all year round. You have rice. You can feed yourself if you have that much amount of land. But here in the Bible is saying, you are a teller of the soil, you are a farmer, and you have nothing. You can't even feed your family. Such a devastation. And he says, you should mourn, you should wail, anticipating this situation happening, this coming to reality. We don't know when the prophet Joel lived and to whom he ministered in the kingdom of Judah, southern kingdom. If, we, if there were a foreign enemy, you know, a kingdom mentioned, we would kind of place this book in a specific era, specific date, but we have none. 
we, we simply do not know. But we do know that he prophesied to the kingdom of Judah, the, the Jew, Jewish people, when they were complacent in their faith. Yes, they were worshiping God. Yes, they were you know, coming to spring offering. They brought offerings to God and worship sacrifice to him. But uh, they were just doing the motions. And God was giving them a wake-up call. You know, wake up. Stop loving the world so much. Stop enjoying the things that God has given you and focus more on God himself. This was a wake-up call. And he was, God was threatening them that a day is coming when you will be mourning. You will be sad because all the things you take for granted will be taken away. And you will have nothing completely stripped away from all the things that you enjoy right now. And God is saying, therefore, you must mourn now. God was saying he's going to allow catastrophe to happen. He's going to let these things come into your life. This uh, difficulty in personal relationship, difficulty in family, broken families will be there because of your loss of spouse. There will be financial difficulties, as you, we read before. And we want to ask the question, why is God allowing these things? And um, why is God letting us read this book after thousands of years later? We find a hint in the second chapter of the same book, chapter 2, verse 13. And I'm going to invite us to read it together. Chapter 2, verse 13. We have it on the screen, I believe. Yes, let's read it together. And rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Joe, in fact, God was saying, don't just go through the motions of saying, I repent, God, and I cry, and you know, a little bit uh, in the worship service, but he's saying, no, don't put sackcloth and have this mournful, you know, uh, attire and this mood, but tear your hearts. Render your hearts. Render your hearts to, to God. And uh, who knows? You know, he's merciful and gracious. He will forgive you. In fact, that is what he's encouraging the people to do, to repent because he, God, will always forgive you. See, God was trying to, was giving, allowing all these things, devastation in the land like never before happened to happen because he wanted, God wanted their hearts to be softened. He wanted their hearts to be tender before him. And God was providing them a reason for their hearts to be tender before God. And God says this more directly in the uh, prophet uh, Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 11, verse 19. And let's read this one together as well. Ezekiel 11, 19, ready, go. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a flesh, heart of flesh. God is saying, I see you guys and your heart is like so cold-hearted. It's like stone um, there's no room for me. You're busy enjoying your day. You're busy doing your transactions. And you're so busy living for yourselves that there's no room for others. I remember a long time ago when I was a kid, I watched my, uh, my mother, mom, prepare meat. And uh, I've seen many different appliances that she uses to cut meat and process and all that. But I've never seen this, this interesting device. You know, she was banging on this piece of meat. I was like, why? Why are you banging on this meat? It's a perfectly fine piece of meat. And uh, she told me, you know, it's called, what's it, what is it called? A meat hammer, I guess, or a mallet. <laughs> She's just banging on this thing to make it soft, to make the meat soft. Mom, why would you beat up a piece of meat to make it soft? It's just the same meat. But, uh, you know, I guess there were like ligaments and, you know, these hard uh, muscle pieces that need to be softened and it's done by, by force. Um, and uh, we get a delicious piece of meat, I guess. And I, I didn't understand, but now I do. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's an, to analogy for what God is trying to do in our lives. Sometimes God allows the pounding and we can only but cry. We can only but wail because of we cannot do anything about it. And uh, the purpose is that God wants our hearts to be tender. 
our cold-hearted hearts that are so self-focused, so, that are so selfish, to be softened, to be tendered, so that it could hear what God is trying to say. Some of you know that uh, my grandma passed away this past Monday morning at 5.08 a.m. Uh, and uh, she lived a really good life. Uh, she was 97. Is that good? 97. Uh, pretty long. I don't think I can live that long. <laughs> Almost a century. Uh, and uh, she lived in Garden Grove uh, in Southern California. And she went to be with the Lord this past Monday. And uh, I, I really love my grandma because she was a woman of faith. And she was the fountainhead. She was the ancestor of faith for our entire family. She shared the gospel with all her sons and daughter. Uh, and uh, when nobody else was a Christian. And she was persecuted so much by her husband, who passed away many years ago. Uh, and, uh, but before he passed away, you know, way before he passed away, he, uh, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He became an elder of a church. And uh, there are many pastors in the family because of grandma's prayer and her sacrifice. And uh, I attended the, f the service yesterday. It was yesterday morning uh, in the, at 10 o'clock. And uh, went there and people, f f we had so many family members. We have about 32 members. And so they flew in from all over, you know, from Korea, from Central California, from Kentucky, from Ohio. And you know, from here to in, in South Southern California as well. And so it was a big gathering. And if, some of them, I've never seen them for like 20 years, some of these relatives, some of these uncles or aunts. And uh, because it's been a while, you know, it's, people tend to be, you know, it's kind of awkward. You don't really know them that well. And sometimes there is some conflict. You know, there have been a conflict in the family. And so they haven't talked to each other for a long time. But at uh, my grandmother's, you know, farewell service, you know, I saw them embracing one another, and loving one another, and comforting one another, praying for each other, sharing a meal together with, among people that haven't been together for like decades. And I thought, wow, somebody dies, especially a person of God dies, and people come together with a tender heart. They are ready to accept one another. How is this possible? In the, in the tears, in the morning, there is unification. There is tenderness of heart. I thought this was a beautiful picture of what Joel is trying to say in our passage today. The reason that God allows tears to run down our cheeks. The reason that he allows heartaches to happen in our lives is to soften our hearts before God. Soften our hearts before one another. To get out of that busy rhythm in our lives, just, just living for our busy careers, living for our, our immediate families, but to, to, to soften that cold heart, stone heart, to embrace what God has allowed in our lives. What is the reason for sorrow? Why does God say, weep and mourn? It is for God, it is to allow us to have a tender heart. Instead of, in a time of difficulty, in time of uh, trials, instead of complaining to God, and in, instead of running away from Him, He gives another option to run toward Him, to soften our hearts. Whenever we run toward Him, we have to ask this question in our hearts, God, is this all happening because there's a sin in my life? Is this is happening because I have, I have done something wrong or my community has done something wrong? It gives us a chance to repent before God. Softening a heart means that we are looking into ourselves, not looking at others, you know, faulting others, trying to find a, pro a problem in others, but looking into our own hearts. You and us, uh, God and us, God and me. God, is there something in my heart? I, need, I want to go back to you. And we, when we go back to Him, He softens our hearts. For he readies us for something. We need to repent when God shows us certain things in our lives. Of course, I'm not saying all bad things that happen around us are a result of our sin, direct sin. But it gives us a chance to check on our hearts, reflect upon our hearts. It gives us a chance to soften our hearts before God. 
it gives us a chance to run back to God. In fact, Jesus emphasized this very thing in the most famous sermon of Jesus' preaching in the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. And if it's on the screen, let's read it, this verse together. Ready? Go. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. One more time. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Even Jesus, is, Jesus says, you should mourn. It is good to mourn. It is, be good, it is good to be brokenhearted before God, to, to be emptied out before God, have this hunger before God. And God sometimes causes that, allows uh, our circumstances so that we cannot but have this tender heart and be broken before Him. We should mourn to have a tender heart. And secondly, why does God allow us to have to uh, tell us to cry. The second reason is this. We should mourn to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the second principle that we want to take away this morning. We should mourn to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want us to go back to verse 15 of the chapter 1. And he mentions something very interesting here, a very interesting word. It says, Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is near. You should cry, alas. You should mourn. You should wail because the day of the Lord is close at hand. What is the day of the Lord? He explains in the same verse, the last part. It says, and as destruction for the Almighty, it comes. The day of the Lord is not just an accidental day, uh, you know, natural catastrophe, you know, a car accident. It's not a, a, a natural dis a disease that happens in around our, our lives. It's not just, you know, oh, you, you caught, uh, uh, caught something disease. It is something that is actively thrown to you by God. You know, a destruction day, a doomsday, if you will. The destruction from the Almighty, it comes. It is a day of judgment. It is a day when everything comes to an a end, a finish. There is no more continuation of this earth as we know of it. It is the day of fiery judgment. And the prophet is saying, we must wail. Alas, we must be mournful because we are expecting this day to come and it's very near. In the New Testament, we call this day the day of the Lord, uh, the judgment day in, in Revelation, right? It is the day that God will judge this earth with fire. It is the day when all commerce, all government, all culture, entertainment will cease as we know it today. The old heaven and new, the old earth will pass away. And seeing all this ahead of time, he's commanding through Joel to, for us to wail, to be saddened, to cry over the things that we love and cherish right now because it will be done for. But I want to ask this question, is God a sadistic God who enjoys our pain and sorrow? He likes to inflict you know, pain in our lives and he's watching up there, you know, enjoying us suffer. And the answer is emphatically no, of course not, right? That's what the Bible is telling us. It's not, of course not. God allows the day of the Lord. In fact, he brings the day of the Lord and he causes us to mourn for the reason, the very reason that he wants us to avoid, to, to um, not encounter this day. He's giving a forecast. He's telling us to prepare your umbrella because it's going to rain today. Why would you tell, uh, tell you the forecast ahead of time? Because God wants you to avoid it. That is what the ultimate message of the book of Joel is. God knows that we are in pain today and there will be an ultimate day of pain, a doomsday in the future. But his heart for us is that we should be able to avoid it. Yes, the day of the Lord is a fearful, uh, a gloomy a doomsday, but it also is, ironically, a day of salvation. And the book of Joel, the same book, chapter 2, verse 31 to 32, tells us how to avoid this day. Brother, could you show that on the screen? Maybe we could read it together. One, 31 and 2. Let's read it together. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, 
before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those the who Lord calls. 31, again, it says, the Lord's day is a doomsday. No mistake, mistake about it. It is uh, a day that we have not experienced. Even today, we have not experienced this. When the sun, sun tar- turns to darkness. I'm not talking about, we're not talking about an eclipse here. About the total, it's still about just total elimination of the sun. No more light. And the moon to blood. It doesn't reflect the sun's light anymore. It's an awesome day that is brought on by the Lord himself. And so we're still anticipating this day, the Lord's day, to come in our future. Although we don't know when. But 32 gives us how to bypass, how to be saved. It says, uh, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And do we know that name of the Lord that gives us that salvation? Yes, we do. The same verse is quoted by Paul in chapter, Romans chapter 10. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, whoever calls on the name of Jesus Christ shall be saved. This is what the book of Joel is saying. You need to cry today. You need to wail right now, knowing that there is impending judgment. There is a doomsday coming. And because of that fact, because I am warning you of this fact, I want you to hide under the shade of this name, Jesus Christ. And that is the, the gospel. That is the blessed message of the book of Joel. And those who have hidden under the wings of Lord Jesus. Uh, the same book of Joel tells us that he gives us something as a token, as a, a guarantee of our, our salvation. In Joel chapter 2 verse 28. Can you show us that verse? And I'll read it for us. Joel chapter 2 verse 28. Uh, says this, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Who is God going to pour out His Spirit on? Is it going to be the priests? Is it going to be the pastors? Maybe uh, you, know, you, pre, you, you, you uh, pray every day you're the, the pious one and God sends the Holy Spirit to you. No. It says, God will pour out His Spirit on all flesh. All people. Uh, without, uh, without favor. He's going to give it to all people who are under the name of Jesus Christ. Whoever calls the name of Jesus Christ will have the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is a Spirit that tells us future things. So it has us see visions, dreams, and speak spiritual wisdom. And who, who is this Spirit? And on the day of Pentecost, uh, we know that when, uh, you know, uh, after Jesus resurrected and He ascended to heaven after 10 days, that just like Jesus promised, the Spirit descended upon all of them in the room all 120 people who are praying. And the Spirit also descended upon us who have trusted in the name of Jesus Christ, who have hidden under the name of Jesus Christ. And so now we know that we can rely upon the Spirit of God who leads us, right? Who speaks to us about our day in the future. He leads us. He wants to lead us. Because we have the name of Jesus Christ and Jesus has sent his spirit upon us to live each day, each day according to his will. We know that the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is a spirit of resurrection. And because of that, even though we may go through seasons of mourning, even a family death, even your spouse, you know, it'll, it'll come, someday it'll come. Even your own death. We do not mourn, we mourn, but we don't mourn too much. In fact, it can be a day of rejoicing because we know there is the resurrection after uh, the suffering. It put it to, to, in terms of, uh, like, to analog, analogize with what Jesus did. Jesus, he was devastated to go to the cross. But Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says that he actually looked forward to the cross. 
He looked beyond the cross. He looked at the joy of a resurrection. And so he took on the cross for himself. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, it says. So although there is tears, although there are suffering and, and difficulty and pain, and God even tells us to, to cry, to mourn, and to wail, we have, when we have this faith as Christians, those who have received the Holy Spirit, as we have this faith that there is a resurrection, that there is healing, that there is restoration beyond our wildest imagination. I haven't read the entire book of Ro uh, the, the chapter of, of Joel in chapter 2, but it gives us all the beautiful pictures of how God will restore the vineyards, the, the plants, and our livelihood. When we have the Spirit of God, when we have that faith in Him, we can be joyful even in those times when we are most painful. I want to, you to look at this picture. Can you show us the picture of my, uh, what we went through last, yesterday? So you can see, that's my grandma. And she's about to be put into the ground. I want you to look at this picture very carefully and tell me what's wrong about it. Everybody's wearing black because it's the funeral thing to do. Uh, there are flowers there and there's the coffin. What's wrong about it? What's odd? Why are people smiling? Why is there a, a smile on these people's faces? I think this is a statement of our faith. Statement of faith that, yes, we are saddened. We are wearing black. We're having this gathering together, costly gathering together. And we're mourning and we're sad. But on the other hand, we are joyful. We know that uh, this Departure is only temporary. So we, don't, we wail, but we don't wail as if, if, if it's a person we'll never see it ever again. We're not putting this person on the ground forever. It is just a temporary, a very short while when the day of the Lord comes and people, holy people, will have resurrected bodies, new bodies which do not get sick, which do not need feeding tubes, which do not need inhalers, which do not need any medicine, a perfect holy body, God will restore for his people. Because we have this faith, of this sure faith of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and those, the resurrection for those who believe in him, we are we able to gladly send her off and say our farewells for her, to her. Um, can we read Romans 8, 11 together? This verse that of faith that we have, the same faith that you and I have. Let's read it together. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The only reason that we could, anybody can, have, uh, can rejoice in a funeral is because if that person has faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only reason that we could uh, be joyful at, a, at the passing of a saint. So my brothers and sisters, dear brothers and sisters, how shall we live? How shall we live as we meditate upon this book of Joel? Especially if, if you and I are in, in times of mourning for various reasons, for various reasons, causes. What, how shall we live? Let us endure our sorrows in order to fill, be filled and be led by the Holy Spirit. Let us endure. We can cry. And the Bible encourages us to cry and to mourn and to wail. But it is not a, a, a vain wail. It is not a wail of hopelessness, right? We are sad because we won't be able to... Uh, endure. We're not. We're being cursed by whatever's around us, and maybe the pangs of the the sting of death is upon us even. And so we, we wail of the loss of something, a uh, loved one or property or whatever. We can we can wail, but we do not wail as those who ha who are hopeless. Although we are saddened, it is we, it is a hopeful wailing, knowing that there is a resurrection, knowing that there is a God who can restore and who will restore into new heaven and new earth. So let us endure. We can even endure the sorrows in our lives because we know that we have the Holy Spirit within us. 
In fact, let our sorrows be a motivation to trust in the resurrected Lord each day. In fact, let our difficulties and pains in our lives be the reason that we desire our Lord all the more. We look forward, I look forward so much to the Holy Spirit who one day, on one day, on the Lord's day, will put to, to hell, in fact, death itself. And the curse will forever be broken. And the Spirit of God is forever with those who trust in the name of Jesus Christ. And when we have this faith, we can go through all kinds of trials and all kinds of sufferings. And yes, we do cry, we do wail, and it hurts so much. But we also have this faith. We have this hope of the Holy Spirit who will recreate, even resurrect our dead bodies. I pray that you will, not only in the future, but right now, be filled with that same Holy Spirit who has the power to resurrect all of us. That you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit and be led by Him. So in our sorrows and trials and difficulties, yes, it hurts, yes, we cry, but we also profess in faith that God is good, God will resurrect, God will heal and restore. So let's have that faith. Amen? Let's pray.